Are you enjoying your position of power maybe a little too much? I sure hope not. Oh, my goodness. Then I would be, I, I, that would be horrible. I, that's not, no. That's Joe Manchin, a Democratic senator from West Virginia. He's the swing vote in a 50-50 Senate, and a guy who has made a home for himself smack in the middle of a hyperpartisan Venn diagram, and also on a houseboat. Year after year, Manchin, the Democrat, gets reelected to serve his constituents in reliably red West Virginia. But lately the gap has been narrowing, and the D next to his name could soon spell the end. But for now, he seems to hold all the power in America, and he's not afraid to wield it. I'm PJ Evans, and this is the story of Joe Manchin. I'm Joe Manchin, and I approve this message, because for me, it's all about West Virginia. He was born in 1947 in the small mining town of Farmington, West Virginia. He went to college at West Virginia University on a football scholarship, where he played quarterback, but his career was cut short by an injury. After college, Manchin worked at his family's grocery store, where his work across the aisles all began. We grew up in the retail business. I've always said in politics, I, it's retail. This is retail politics. And retail politics is simply knowing who your customer is and making sure they're satisfied. Manchin comes from a prominent political family. His uncle, A. James Manchin, was a flashy state politician who has been credited with helping JFK win the state of West Virginia in the 1960 presidential election. My uncle, A. James Manchin, had the honor of introducing Senator Kennedy when he traveled to West Virginia during his presidential campaign. From 1928 all the way to 2000, the state of West Virginia only voted for a Republican for president five times. It was a deep blue Democratic stronghold. But the tide has changed. Today, the overall population is aging as young people are leaving in search of jobs. Opioids have a grip on the state, which has the second highest rate of drug abuse in the U.S. And the coal industry has completely collapsed, despite Trump's promise to bring it back. Y'all put it on, right? In a way, you can think of West Virginia as sort of the last southern state. Patrick Hickey, a former professor at the University of West Virginia and an expert on Congress and the presidency, told us. So that's a sentiment I hear a lot, is Democrats ran this place for decades. They didn't do anything to help us. You know, it's time to try something else. Hickey believes that sentiment, compounded with the idea of a war on coal, are key drivers to the political sea change in West Virginia. I think coal in West Virginia really is it's a symbol for the previous way of life. People often ask me, like, do West Virginians really think coal is actually going to come back? And I think the answer to that is like, no. You know, I think West Virginians realize that coal probably isn't going to boom back, but they want what coal represented, right? Which was you could do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. In West Virginia, our people are proud to give a good day's work for a good day's pay. The war on coal has been largely blamed on the Democrats, and namely Obama, for environmental regulations. While coal jobs did in fact decline under Obama, they had been declining for decades, since the 1920s, you know, famously before Obama took office. Experts claim that cheap, abundant gas retrieved via fracking, paired with the advancement of renewables, have been greater causes of coal's demise than any green regulations. But regardless, since 2000, the state has consistently and overwhelmingly voted to elect Republican presidents. So how is Joe Manchin, the Democrat, hanging on? Manchin's rise to power started in 1982, when he was elected to West Virginia's House delegates. Four years later, he was elected to the state Senate, and in 1996, he ran for governor, but lost the primary. Why did you lose? What did you learn from I didn't that? do a good job. I didn't explain. I, didn't, I don't think I did a good enough job explaining uh, who I was and what I thought the state could be and how we were going to change the state. In 2001, Manchin was elected Secretary of State in West Virginia, and four years later, he finally became governor. Politico notes Manchin was a tax-cutting, anti-abortion, pro-gun Democrat. He also supported a livable wage, at the time, at least. As governor, I will not spend one dollar of your taxes trying to attract a job that's a minimum wage job of six and seven dollars with no benefits. I think we've done that for far too long. We've got to make sure that we, first of all, we retain what we have, 
and make sure that those people are paying a livable wage with health care and benefits. Any job we attract that should fit in West Virginia must be a livable wage with health care. In 2010, Manchin was elected to the Senate, where he's been serving the American people ever since, mostly from his houseboat Almost Heaven, anchored eight miles south of the Capitol. You buy something permanent, they think you like the place. And I sure as hell don't like the place. During Obama's presidency, Manchin was careful to not tie himself too closely to the president, who lost overwhelmingly in the Mountain State. As your senator, I'll protect our Second Amendment rights. That's why the NRA endorsed me. I'll cut federal spending, and I'll repeal the bad parts of Obamacare. I sued EPA, and I'll take dead aim at the cap-and-trade bill. Because it's bad for West Virginia. In addition to shooting Obama's cap-and-trade bill, Manchin ended up voting with the Senate Democratic Caucus only 72.8% of the time, which was the lowest of any sitting Democrat. Voting against Obama's agenda in key instances, paired with challenges from weak opponents, gave Manchin the edge back home when it came to his re-election. In 2012, Manchin won overwhelmingly by 24 points. But then came Manchin's re-election bid in 2018. Just two years prior, in the 2016 presidential election, Trump had taken West Virginia by a landslide, 67.9% to Hillary's 26.2%, and it was clear the state's politics were rapidly shifting. But once again, Manchin, the Democrat, hung on to reclaim his seat by a little over three percentage points. As perplexing as it is to edge out a Republican, who had Trump's endorsement, in a Republican stronghold, there's a simple explanation. Patrick Hickey told us, He does take the traditionally Democratic positions most of the time, maybe 80% of the time. But you know, that 20% he doesn't, I think, is, is really strategic. For example, during Trump's presidency, Manchin voted for Trump's agenda more than any other Democrat. But at the same time, Manchin voted against Trump's tax cuts, he didn't side with Republicans to repeal and replace Obamacare, he didn't confirm Betsy DeVos, but in the end, one month before his re-election, Manchin was the lone Democrat to vote for the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Patrick Hickey told us again, I think if Joe Manchin voted against confirming Brett Kavanaugh, we'd be talking about Senator Morris and not Senator Manchin. And I stand up and, and I support him when it's good for West Virginia, and when it's not, uh, I stand up to him, and I think that's what it takes. Manchin's success can also be attributed to his opposition to ideas from the progressive wing of his party. He doesn't support Medicare for all, he doesn't believe in packing the Supreme Court, and when it comes to defunding the police, Manchin, 73 years old, said, quote, defund my butt. Strategy is what defines Manchin, and his has earned him a unique and broad coalition of support. From centrists on both sides, conservatives and staunch Trump supporters, and liberals and leftists who have no other option but to bite their tongue and cast their ballot for the lesser of two evils. When Democrats took control of the White House, Senate, and once again House, Manchin's centrism took center stage. When Biden's $1.9 trillion relief package was introduced, Manchin had his way with it. Although the Senate parliamentarian, who apparently has more power than the president, advised against including the $15 minimum wage, it was Manchin's opposition to including the provision in the bill that doomed it from the start. Legal documents show Manchin has financial stakes in companies that pay less than $15 an hour, so we can chop this up to a conflict of interest. He did support a smaller increase, though. Joe Biden has said anybody that goes to work, and I believe this with all my heart, if you go to work every day, you should, at the end of the day, be above the uh, minimum guidelines as far as the poverty guidelines. You should be above that. That should be the absolute low base. Well, when you do it and you figure the numbers, Chuck, it comes out to $11. That's how I got to 11 The Charleston Gazette notes, quote, at $11 an hour, a worker would bring in $22,000 a year, just above the federal government's poverty threshold for a family of three. Manchin favors phasing in that wage starting at the end of next year until 2024. After that, the minimum wage would be indexed, increasing with inflation rather than by legislation." Unquote. Despite one poll revealing that 63% of West Virginians supported the $15 minimum wage increase, it was not included in the relief bill. And it was also Manchin that insisted on capping stimulus check eligibility at $80,000 rather than $100,000, which was the original number. And it was Manchin who insisted on lowering unemployment benefits by $100. 
According to Hickey, there's a perception in West Virginia that there's a class of people there who are just taking advantage of government entitlement programs. He told us, Making that his issue with the COVID relief bill and getting a little win on that, I think also, you know, just builds this sort of reputation he has in West Virginia. Manchin's endeavoring to comprehend West Virginia and his place in it will be ongoing for the next few years. Hickey told us, Once Manchin goes, West Virginia is going to be dominated by Republicans for decades to come. Manchin won't be up for re-election until 2025, but with the sea changing back home, almost heaven's chances of staying afloat are slim to none. Hey, I'm Sean Morrow, host of the Now This podcast, Who Is? You might remember me from those annoying ads you were subjected to at the end of videos for like two years. Who are the people that run the world? Um, things have changed a bit since I last saw you. You know, pandemic, insurrection, Emily in Paris getting nominated for a Golden Globe. But I'm still trying to figure out who are the people who run the world? On Who Is? the podcast, we examine power through the stories of the people who haven't. From mercenary forces, to the big businesses controlling your food, to a hedge fund manager who basically holds countries for ransom. To tell these stories, we bring in cool guests from people you've heard of, like Stacey Abrams, to people you haven't, like law professors digging into police union contracts, and reporters following the money that flows from the donor class to the politicians who supposedly represent all of us. Two seasons, that's 32 episodes, are ready for you to binge. And we're back for season three, where we'll look at the giant corporations that might ruin weed for everyone, the organizations who ensure police aren't held accountable for misconduct, and the wealthy interests who are fighting to keep America sick and unhealthy, so they can, you know, make money off of it. Look for Who Is, the podcast, on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's Who Is the Podcast.